You're listening to JTE Movie Thinks. Is that is that the title? Is that is that correct grammar? All right, we'll go with it. It's a show about movies and thinking. And now here's your host, Every Man's Hero, JTE. Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to our episode of JTE Movie Thinks. Guys, got another first timer with me, which I was actually surprised when I asked you. I was like, have you been on my podcast? I, I almost said it like, you've been on my podcast before, right? That's exactly it. You, you said it even more accusingly like, you, well, when, you said when was the last time yeah, you were on right. my podcast? And you have not been on. I've never. Uh, we've done a lot of the, the reviews for YouTube. I think true. that's where the confusion may have come from. Is that we review a lot. Yes, guys, if you don't know who I'm talking to, this is Lon Harris. Hey. Some of you might know him as the professor. It, so, fairly new. If you're new. a Schmodown fan. Yeah, if you're a Schmodown fan. Uh, but I've been working with Lon for a couple of years now. He's one of the writers here at Screen Junkies. That I am. Um, yeah, first of all, very talented. Oh, you're uh, very kind. Like, every time I think I am a little bit movie smart, I talk to Lon and I'm like, oh, he's on another level than me. Well, this is the great thing about. Being, as you say, movie smart, uh, <laughs> a, a term I like, is that no matter how movie smart you are, there is somebody you will encounter who knows more about yes. movies than you. And it's really weird and exciting because sometimes you'll get a little confidence and then somebody will just come along and blow you away and tell you about a million things you never even heard of and you feel like an idiot. Yeah, when it comes to like the Screen Junkie gang, I think you and I and maybe Dan are like another level compared to like everybody else. Not It's nothing saying like Joe, they have certain things they know way more than I do. Right. Right. Joe knows anime better than I do. Exactly. Those little pockets <laughs> yeah. of knowledge that we don't always necessarily yes. have. Where I think you, me, and Dan maybe are the three most knowledgeable overall. Especially when I it comes to like sounds right. older films and foreign films. And that's, I think that's where outside we... Outside the popular. That's where we get the win. Is like, yeah. I may not know as much about all the Marvel movies <laughs> as other people. Or like, I may not be able to tell you the difference between like Transformers 3 and 4. But I think... You, me, and Dan are the only three screen junkies who really have a lot of, like, 70s and earlier yeah. kinds of knowledge. And maybe just smaller films that some of the mainstream might not have got into. Sure. Uh, there's films I'm like, hey, have you heard of this? And no one will be like, no, I haven't seen it. I've seen that. And you'd be like, I've seen it. Nah, <laughs> or yeah. Dan, like, I've seen it. It was working at the video store. I, I worked well, at... I worked at video stores, movie theaters my whole right. life. Uh, for three years specifically, I worked at a, a store here in L.A. called Laser Blazer, like a mm -hmm. DVD laser disc store that also rented... Uh, I worked there with... With William Bibiani, also right. of the Schmodown. We worked there. Yeah. That's where we got to know each other. Uh, and that, it was, we would put movies on in the back of the room all the time. We would just have, you would you'd be able to take anything home with you for the night and bring it mm -hmm. back the next day. And it just would equal, mil you, you would just watch so many movies, more than you could even tr keep track of, more than you could even remember that you'd watch. Yeah, I worked at Hollywood Video for about a year. And I th remember, remember when I used to give employees their own recommend sure <laughs> like i pride myself on putting like really obscure or just films that <laughs> like not everybody's gonna know right and like when people would come in and ask like hey i'm here to write a movie like what kind of movies do you like they would give me a few and then i would try to find something that was like something they probably never heard of but i think they would like i loved mm -hmm. getting people come back and be like oh man i really enjoyed that to the point where like customers would be like i want him to recommend me a movie because yeah. he's recommend some really cool stuff that was always a good feeling when you would recommend stuff to people and after a while they would just start coming to you and you could tell that the point of the trip was to ask you what to watch and like mm -hmm. that's a good it feels like you know not your you know, you're really helping people out. You're really introducing them to this whole kind of new thing that they might not have known about. Yeah, I mean, I think any movie fan loves introducing other people to hidden gems. I mean, part of this podcast is I don't know what movie you're, we're going to talk about today. That's right. I'm going to I'm going to surprise <laughs> you're gonna surprise you. me. Now, most of the time, if you listen to the show, I've seen the movie. But there has been several times. How Run that came on talked about a documentary, which I never heard of. What did he? What, which, I, what documentary? You don't remember, remember it? I, uh, don't, I never got. To, a lot of times when I that happens, I like to go and catch the movie. Sure. But that was a movie. I just it was a hard to find documentary. I uh, will have to ask how the movie seemed yeah. today. Uh, but yeah, like there's some really interesting movies that do pop up where I'm like, I seen it, but it's a long time ago, or I know it well, or sometimes it's a movie where I'm just like, what? what? Tell me about, this <laughs> Tell movie. about the movie. Uh, I had Bibiana here a couple weeks ago, and he reminded me of a film that the house that bleeds, the house that bleeds. Yeah, the house that bleeds. Yeah, well, I am. I am. Uh, I'm. I've heard of that. I have not seen that movie. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. But we went on this whole talk about movie anthologies or horror movies like Tales from the Dark Side. Sure. I mean, Twilight Zone is kind of like the Godfather of that in a lot of ways because well, I'm talking about the '80s one. Right. But you guys, so. Again, I love creep just show. Creep shows using awesome. this show as a way to talk about other movies and bring up movies that I haven't yeah. 
be able to talk about. Let's talk about it. So, you know how this works, Lon. Basically, I, I want you to tell me the last movie you watched. Not something that you saw in theaters. Mm -hmm. Not something that you had to go over for a review. Not something you had to watch for research. Because you watch a lot of stuff here for research. I do. Well, the answer would have been uh, Jurassic World if it was what I did yeah. for research because we're working on a video where I'm watching all the Jurassic Park movies. But So we won't do that. I'm also, yeah, Mission yeah. Impossible. Summer, it's a big, that's a big season for me going back and watching old franchises because it's always like, well, there's a new Mission impossible we got to talk about it no i'm with you but i'm not talking we won't do those today well yeah so for me like this is why this is what i love about the show i wonder the last time you walked over to your maybe your blu-ray collection we are going to talk about a blu-ray okay maybe it was something you saw on netflix maybe it was something that you just said you know what i haven't seen it in a long time for instance last night uh or the night before i had never seen inside lewis davis yeah we, we talked yes, about it. yes and right. i bought the blu-ray man i love that movie. earlier this year and i just as well as movies, sometimes you buy a Blu-ray, you don't watch it right away. Sure. You're just not in the mood. Or like, I was going through my collection, I was like, what do I want to watch tonight? And I thought, oh, you know what? I still haven't watched this yet. I grabbed off my thing, I put it in, I really loved it. It's an amazing it, I want to buy the soundtrack. It's one of my <laughs> favorite Coen Brothers movies. That's true. One of the first, the, speaking of the soundtrack, before we move on, to Inside okay. Lewis Davis, that was one of the first moments where Adam Driver, because I didn't watch Girls, so <laughs> yeah. I didn't know him from TV. Okay. So I'm watching that movie, and he's playing this this oddball character. One, it's a one scene, too. And they're doing that song, Please, Mr. Kennedy, with Justin Timberlake, and his yep. job is just doing these deep bass lines, like, yeah. space. <laughs> and it was the first time I was like, who is this actor? This is so weird. Yeah. I loved it. I also, Carrie Mulligan was almost recognizable, unrecognizable to me at first. I was yeah. like, I'm watching. I'm like, is that Carrie Mulligan? Oh my God, that's Carrie Mulligan. Yeah. Uh, Goodman also amazing in a in yeah, a brief role. Brief role, yeah. yeah. So overall, really enjoyed the movie. So I'm excited to hear what's the last time. I'm, you said it's a Blu-ray. It's a Blu-ray. Were you so, at home? Were you just like, what should I watch tonight? And you I was over at home. Uh, so recently, uh, I realized I didn't own any Miyazaki on blu-ray or anything like i'd seen a bunch of them but i'd seen almost every miyazaki movie that i'd seen only oh, yeah. one time okay uh like in theaters or whatever and i and i was like i i always like them and so yeah. i i bought four of them on blu-ray that i knew were were the ones that i had liked uh my neighbor totoro yeah uh princess mononoke great um well, let's, oh, uh, now I'm blanking on one of the four. We'll come back. Spirited it's not Spirited Away, because I never loved that one. Everybody, okay. Like, a, a, a lot of people really love that it. one. Yeah. It's always, it's like, oh, Ponyo. And then Ponyo. the one we're going to talk about, Howl's Moving Castle. Oh, That's Howl's the last Moving one Castle. I watched it two nights ago. Now, here's the thing. I, I've not seen Howl's Moving Castle. Oh, great. But Wonderful. I did see Castle in the Sky. That's a different one. Which is, the, whenever it's, everyone, I know they're two different movies, but I liked Castle in the Sky. That was a really good I one. I like that one, too. And also, uh, Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind is one that they did, Amazon didn't have when I was ordering, so I'm going to go back. But uh, I like that one a lot, too. Now, Howl's Moving Castle is definitely more recent than Castle in the Sky. Yes. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle was one of them. I think it was before Ponyo more, was the most recent yeah, so one. Was, yeah, it was the most recent one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I missed Ponyo and Howl's Moving Castle, which I believe were his last two. Yes. I um, believe that is correct. And well, I, no, there was, is, there's one more, right? He made his last movie, yeah. which is not mm. either of those two. All I know is I remember Spirit Away when it hit theaters. It was a big deal. And, I, I, that, and that, was the, that was the first one that I went and saw in a theater. And I really liked it. I don't mean to be dismissive of it. it just it, It's never been one of my favorites of his for whatever reason. I think a lot of it is that... Um, is it? It's a more kid oriented. I would say it's a little more kid oriented. It, it, Although my neighbor Totoro is very kid oriented. It, well, yeah, but I mean, my neighbor Totoro is. It, it speaks to such sort of like classic universal themes yeah. that I, I feel like it sort of exceeds beyond an age group, whatever. But Spirited Away, it's also it's so caught up in Japanese mythology mm -hmm. and religion. See, that's that what fascinates me about it. It's great, which but it, it makes it a little impenetrable. Whereas some of the other movies, I think, are just much more immediate. Like I just I get exactly what the movie is getting at. I understand the cosmology of it. Well, like, like Princess Mononoke or even Nausicaa. Like those are examples. Like it's a lot of mythological themes, but it, I also don't find it obscure at well, all. Well, and there's much more action, more mature right. based movies. Like as a teenager, when I started going into this whole Mickey, I can't Miyazaki. Say, Miyazaki craze, you know, I started with Totoro and I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely a kid's movie. But once you get to Princess Mononoke, it's visually amazing. It's very mature. I mean, Mononoke is great action. Basically a war movie. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's very intense and it's, it's just so like all of his movies have incredible designs. They feel very, they feel very distinctive. He's creating these huge worlds. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of why I wanted to talk about House Moving Castle. But but yeah, I mean, Mononoke is really where you see that. It, like every sequence is just there's so much depth. There's so much going on on screen. It's such a visual, where, such a visual feast. I agree. I guess when I watch Prince Mononoke, like I love it as an action film and like this weird kind of like fantasy film. But when I watch Spirit Away, it's just a fun movie. Like I'm watching it and I'm just like, oh, this is just so much fun. Yeah, there's some adult themes in there. It's a little bit of scary stuff in there a little bit yeah, too. Yeah, it, it but definitely it almost has, like, feels there's like darkness behind. It feels like almost like Alice in Wonderland meets something else. Yeah, and I mean a lot of his movies have that. You know, they they tie they they don't they're not all based on classic mm-hmm. kids literature, but they always tie into those kind of classic themes of being yeah like swept away or changed or transported to some other kind of heightened reality and i yeah spirited away is definitely like tapping into that so because i miss house moon castle give me a quick elevator pitch and then give me your thoughts on the film overall wow so it it, it is <laughs> it's, it's hard it's com- it's complicated it's tough to it's tough to sort of definitely uh get your head around but it's basically a girl who works in a hat shop it takes place in a it's based on an, an English sort of fairy tale or children's book, children's novel. Okay. So it, it, it's happening in kind of an imaginary Europe instead of the typical Asian setting of a lot of other Miyazaki mm-hmm. films. Uh, and it is a girl who works in a hat shop, uh, and she becomes caught up in this sort of war between magicians, and, and a lot of it is about which side of the war the magicians are going to align with. And there is a magician named Hal, and the one side of the war really wants him to come on board and join join their cause and, and use his okay. magic to forward their war and he doesn't want to. And this girl that he likes, he becomes friends with, this ordinary non-magical girl, she gets kind of caught up in the middle of this fight over whether Hal is going to join the war or not. And it's also, there's right. a lot going on about Hal having a dual nature. that, And sometimes he seems like a regular human man who could just do magic, but then sometimes he transforms into sort of some kind of Raven or Crow. How much of it takes place on this moving castle? A lot of it takes place in the moving castle, which also has, this is what I love so much about the movie, and, and it's it's so intricate. There's It's, it's really complex, uh, the view of sort of magic. The castle moves on its own, so it can just float and transport itself, but it also has a, almost like a Rick and Morty portal door, so you can, okay. you can switch a <laughs> dial by the door and exit, and it will be a building Building in this town or, or this Doctor town. Doctor Strange? It's a little Doctor Strange. Yeah, which is like it, it plays a lot around with that idea of like dimensions and portals. Okay. That's interesting. And so there's a lot of mechanics in the movie where like they run into the castle and switch the door and then run out somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And there's also this whole heightened fantasy world that Hal can move into that the other characters don't get to explore. Wow, very interesting. When I saw the trailer for this, like the actual movie castle looks amazing. It's amazing. Uh, and I mean, it, it, a great use of the really intensely detailed yes. Miyazaki style where he can draw. It's so yeah, intricately designed. It's funny because we and just, it changes over the course of the movie. We just had a trailer recently for Mortal Engines, the uh, new Peter Jackson produced film. Is that it, Mortal? Mortal Engines. Engines, yeah, yeah. okay. And I saw the trailer for this week, and when you see the big moving, like, cities, almost right. like a, it's almost like a giant vehicle, it gave me a little hint of, like, Howl's Moving Castle as far sure. as the visual. Yes. I wonder if that at all was uh, inspired. Well, no, Jackson's thing is based on a book series, right? It is, right? yeah. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, but maybe. still, like, visually, it just. It does. It, it, it's, it felt a little bit Man, I'm curious castle. about that. It looks great, but it also, it's hard to wrap your head around how it's going to work as a movie, you know? Yeah. Well, again, how Moving Castle. I, I do like the whole when he plays with the more fantasy stuff, like Spirited yes, Away. Yes, and this is, I, I do too, and this is very much in that high fantasy, like a Mononoke mm-hmm. or a Nausicaa. Very complicated. Like, it's weird that it's based on a kid's book, because there's a lot of ins and outs, a lot about the war and everything. So I, I guess the original book must be very detailed as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I got to say this. I do like, do you, you, we grew up in the 80s, early 90s, when I feel sure. like cartoons, especially for kids, were a little bit more edgy. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, nowadays, I guess, I mean, How You Train Dragon, I think, was actually one of the, actually one of the more recent kids' movies that got a little bit edgy. Like, in part two, there's some death. Yeah. And there's some consequences. But, like, do you remember, like, Secret and Them? Sure. Like, there is stabbings and blood and, like, some, it's almost like a gothic 
kids movie. It's it. There was a in the sixties and seventies. There was this increasing acceptance for like adult animation. Like mm-hmm. Ralph Bakshi was doing like Fire and Ice and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but that's different than a kids movie. And then, no, it is. But yeah. I'm saying like and, and you know Belladonna of Sadness and like the, that kind of stuff. Heavy metal. Heavy metal. Yeah. And, and, and I feel like that tradition, the fact that there it was accepted that sometimes uh-huh. cartoons are for adults. Yep allowed animation to be more for everybody as opposed to just for kids. And then sometime that, that era ended and, and sometime in like the late eighties and nineties, maybe around the Disney Renaissance or whatever. Yeah. The idea became no, no animated movies are musicals and they're for children. Yeah. And Disney just, really kind of, and that's just what they are. And, and but adults had, should be embarrassed to go see a kid's cartoon. But you had Don Bluth who in the eighties made movies like, Lamp for a Time is not like a... And you know, All Dogs Go to Heaven all dogs has go to some heaven. darkness, yeah. I mean, even Lamp for a Time is actually a pretty, like, if you actually watch it, like the, I don't want to say cinematography, but the way they drew it, it's a very dark, a lot of, lot of dark yeah, tones. Yeah, I mean, but it is still, it's very, it's very much for kids. It's very yeah. juvenile, and then it's just like, we're going to push these kids, like, we're going to push the boundary... Sort of like a little bit. Whereas Miyazaki, I mean, they're not inappropriate for kids. Kids can watch and enjoy no, all these movies. Totally. But stuff like How's Moving Castle, to me, is definitely made with a more mature audience. I mean, it might even be the difference between teenagers yeah. versus children. I don't feel like he makes it with a certain audience in mind. No, I, think I think he's yeah, just he, trying to tell the story he wants to tell. And yeah, really tapping into sort of big yeah. universal things like 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 Totoro, what we'd already said. Like that is a story about children and it's it it, it Mm-hmm. On some level, it's a story about an imaginary friend, mm-hmm. which kids can definitely relate mm-hmm. to. But it, it also is just feelings of isolation and loneliness, the environmental themes, mm-hmm. uh, and just, you know, like escaping trauma and tragedy into fantasy, which is really yeah, everybody can relate They've to. They've tried it in the 90s. What was it, Titan AE? Sure, yeah, yeah. You don't really see these cartoon movies made for, like, the, I guess – teenager or like yet more it just became adult. like uncool at a certain point i don't know because yeah like titan ae i think it was a pretty big failure for the most it part it did not yet it did was not, not a commercial good. success but that was not a movie you were like i'm gonna bring my kids to it was really like they were like let's make movies for kind of I mean, adults it's it also bad like i think that yeah, if titan ae had been great then yeah. i think that it might have well, found its audience another one would be final fantasy remember that movie sure. that was all the spirits within yeah, spirit yeah. within like I thought it was real interesting how they were making these big budget movies, but they weren't really targeting kids. Why do you think that never really took off or went anywhere? I mean, then there's like extremes like Sausage Party where they're just like the joke is yeah. Well, like I mean, Team I America, it's rated R. I do we're going as hard as we can. I actually feel like the thing that may ultimately bridge this gap is superheroes because we're so I used totally to superheroes. There's animated movies mm-hmm. and shows. There's live action. Incredibles two is coming. Up. Incredibles two, great example. Into the Spider Verse coming out later this year, which great is really going to be yeah. a, an animated, but. Uh, it feels like a Spider-Man movie, like a legit totally Spider-Man agree. movie. Um, yeah, so, I, and I mean, you know, DC's got that long history of those animated Straight to films. DVD, yeah. Right, so I feel like that's kind of opened up, like, you don't have to feel weird about being an adult watching a cartoon anymore because we've now introduced all these characters you love. They're coming from comic mm. books, which are basically drawn as well. I remember, you know, watching Justice League and thinking to myself, it was around the same time the new Injustice game came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, the, like, the opening cinematic was amazing. Those Injustice yeah. games are great. And the tie, have you actually read the tie-in comic? No. Also great. So as I'm watching, I'm thinking, you know what? DC, just give me, if you gave me a full-blown, like, CGI, Pixar-style, but with, like, kind of more edgier and more detailed oh, graphics, man. you're, you're Justice talk, League. You're talking my language. Yeah. I'd love this. I would I mean, love it. Like, give me, like, the stuff I'm seeing in these cutscenes in a movie form where you just hire great voice actors. Yeah. And you could really push that kind of fantasy element to it you, you to could, another level. You could really have two simultaneous cinematic mm-hmm. universes going, an animated one and a live action one. Mm-hmm. And there's really no, I don't think there's a good reason not to do that. Yeah, I don't think l- people would get confused. I, I think yeah. people would love it. And you could do so much more comic book style storytelling. I mean, like Infinity War really shows us that if you spend the money, if you take the time, yep. you can you, translate you can one of these big comic books to the screen. Agreed. But, it's a lot easier if you animate it. You yeah. don't have to do well, it that way. That's the thing. Like I like the hand drawn animation they're doing, but that could still they could still do that and it'll go straight to DVD. Sure. And and there's so many all of these comic publishers, there's so many of these Elseworld stories or alternate narratives or other things they could be doing that they don't want to do in the live action mm-hmm. movies because it would throw off the whole shared exactly. universe. But that you could do animated. One of the like best Red Sun or Kingdom Come. One of the best action scenes I've seen this year 
was in Ready Player One, the race scene. Yeah, the opening. And like, that the, the, entire thing was made in a computer. Sure. It was, uh, but you had a skilled director who know what he wanted. You give me a Just League movie with that level of, you know, animation with action sequences, like the camera could be all one take. Very much like uh, speaking of Spielberg, Adventures of Tintin. Yeah. I, I like the movie, I think, more than most. I, as, as Schmodown fans will know, I don't remember everything yeah, about okay. it that well. This well, was my losing question with Ethan Irwin. But um, here's the thing, though. When I saw it in theaters, I could tell Spielberg was playing with a new way of filmmaking that he'd never really used before. Right. Because there's a sequence that starts at the top of a city, and it's a one continuous shot of this mm-hmm. chase. Yeah, I remember it. All the way through down. And I just remember thinking to myself, my God, like... Spielberg is literally, you can just see him having a ball. He's like, I can put this camera wherever I want. Right. I don't have to cut. And I can just put together this amazing action sequence. So if you could do that with a Just League type movie, I think you could, like you said, break through this well, barrier. Yeah, and I mean, to me, it's it's unquestionable that you now could, like, we're in the era where you can make a animated movie that mostly passes as live action and no one will really know the difference. I mean, we already have, you know, like... Jungle Book and Lion King coming mm-hmm. out. These these war yeah, which is like war we- for the Planet of the Apes. I mean, like there's a lot of shots. <laughs> there's a lot of shots with Woody Harrelson on screen, but there's a lot of shots without Woody Harrelson on screen where yeah. it's just apes on horses. But and like, like those are not there. Well, that's one thing that really worked for me. Ready Player One is because when you talk about that movie, like apes and even the Jungle Book. They're making that animation to the point where they you want to th- just think it's real, right? And like, I'm you, watching play apes. I'm no. I, I stopped thinking about them being CGI. Sure. I'm just like that looks so realistic to me that I just accept them as characters. What I like about Ready Player One is they didn't have to go that ultra realistic. Yeah, they're still able to like you know they're in a video game. Yet when King Kong was jumping through the town, I was like, this is some of the best King Kong action I've ever seen. I, a, a thing I really liked in Ready Player One that they did is the scene where uh, the the. Nolan, I forget it. Nolan Bushnell, whatever uh, the the bad guy. Oh, <laughs> Nolan Ben, ben Mendelsohn. Yeah, Ben yeah. Mendelsohn's character. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking of his character's yeah, yeah, name yeah, in yeah, the yeah. Um, So anyway, when when he thinks he's in the real world, but he's still inside mm-hmm. the oasis, you and they tell. kind of like they're ten percent not photo real. Yep. Like that's a really cool showcase for like they could do it better, yep. but they're kind of purposefully making it not look great so that you get the idea that he's in virtual reality. And that's what I mean. Like like if you did animate like a Justice League movie that way, you you would have the option of making them look almost photo real, but you would also have the option of making it look more stylized. You could like what uh, Enter the Spider Verse has done. Like yeah. it, it doesn't look real, but it, it also it doesn't stylized. look it, it looks like a comic book has a very specific style yeah i totally agree i it's weird because you you go back to miyazaki i think his biggest hit was spirited away in the u.s yeah well that was the big like theatrical hit yeah but his movies don't come here and make like a crap load of money usually they're like limited release like but they're never just like these huge things that people in america are waiting to see i think poinio got a pretty good wide release but they don't make money they're not like you know juggernauts over here right why do you think that is do you think just why has anime never really had like transition to American audiences? Uh, I mean, I think there's a bunch of reasons. I think that you know both dubbing and subtitling have downsides. Not everybody likes mm-hmm. it. Some audiences don't like dubbing. Some audiences refuse to read subtitles. It's hard to get everybody sort of on the same page about something that's foreign. I also do think that um, Americans have some. You know, they they kind of assume foreign movies are not going to be as accessible as movies from America mm-hmm. in ways that I think people maybe from other countries don't feel about American movies. Uh, and and, yeah. and I think that that is just sort of a natural block. It is true that a lot of Miyazaki films, though, like what kind of what I was saying about Spirited Away, you kind of have to spend a little bit of your time kind of figuring out the cultural context for everything. Mm-hmm. They're not always super obvious. And like every anime example almost every anime project this is true on some level Mm -hmm. it's these are weird stories these are always very japanese specific stories a lot of the time uh and and they have a lot of rules and a lot of themes and a lot of things that are a little more complex they're not impossible to parse and sometimes i think like very accessible stuff like cowboy bebop or ninja scroll 
Ninja it's, Scroll. It's I remember immediate. that one. Like, you don't need yeah. to really think about the cultural context. It's just like, okay, I get it. It's, it's a, an act. Ninja he, Scrolls is an action he, movie. Yeah, he's got a sword. He's wandering around. He's killing demons. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. Um, but most of the, the projects, you, you, you know, you got to spend a little time sort of unpacking it a little bit. And I think True. that's a lot of work for people, and it's easier to just throw on Tangled. Yeah, growing up, I remember I had a friend who, I think everyone has that friend who was really into anime. If sure. You, if you weren't. <laughs> and I was not really into anime no. growing up. It, it was, it, I had some of these, you know, prejudices against myself. Uh, uh, it was really, you know, like Cowboy Bebop. I had a roommate in college who really liked it. Really liked it. Yeah. And like, then I watched that and I was like, oh, I, 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 get, I get this. Okay. I think Akira is a lot of the ones that most people point to. Like, you want to oh, you really want, late to Akira. You want to start watching anime? Let me give you my copy of Akira. I'd seen a lot of anime before I really? saw Really? That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Akira is like the go to for people who are introduced to the franchise. Or well, I mean, like, it's like the, the genre. It's like the most famous, iconic yeah. example. But Do you no, enjoy I, it? I, no, I like Akira a lot, but yeah, I'd seen, I'd definitely seen Ghost in the Shell mm. before Akira. And also when I was in, I think when I was like right out of UCLA was when Satoshi Kon was really becoming notable, like Tokyo Godfathers mm -hmm. and Perfect Blue. And then I saw Paprika. Uh, and I think that was really more of my way in. Interesting. Um, as opposed to uh, Akira. Yeah, for me, it was like Ninja Scroll, Akira, and then a couple other things. My, I had a roommate... Uh, well, yeah, he was a short-term roommate who really liked Berserk, which mm -hmm. was like a TV series. Yeah. So I was forced to watch some of that. But yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. I think Miyazaki kind of transcends like all those other ones we just mentioned because I feel like he is kind of like the Spielberg of anime. Right. Well, I mean, it also feels like, and I don't mean to disparage, like a lot of people who make anime are, are, are tapping into very complicated ideas, big themes. I don't, I'm not trying to dismiss other people, but I think that Miyazaki, he, he has that, it's Spielberg is a good, a good example. Yeah. He has that, it's a more mainstream it's touch. It's more universal. Yes. And I think that there are like, something like Ghost of the Shell is like full of ideas and it's really complicated and interesting mm -hmm. and it's massively influential, but it's, it's a little bit of a tough nut to crack. It's very heady. It's very cerebral. It's it's a little talky. And I think that Miyazaki's films are just so beautiful that it, it pulls you in immediately just based on how beautiful it looks and how sort of like the character work that he's doing. And I think that it pulls you in that way and then you get to explore some of the Does ideas. Miyazaki, has he incorporated some CGI to any of his movies or are they mainly still hand-drawn? They're, ma they're only mainly still hand-drawn. Yeah. I, I do not have this answer. Okay, uh, I was I, just curious because I know for a long time- I feel time, like there's gotta be some gotta be, CGI right? elements on something like HAL, which is so yeah. huge and has so many big moving parts and, and action sequences well, or whatever. But definitely in terms of like the back, the backgrounds and the characters mm -hmm. and the really important stuff is always hand drawn. Yeah, because that's the big thing with him. Like when I first, like he was still making these movies in an age where Toy Story and right. Monsters Inc. were just dominating the box office, kind of changing the way people were looking. There was a what was the last time America released a two yeah. D animation? It's it's a, we I don't had know. Princess and the Frog. Yeah, it's very. And I don't it, know if there's anything any, at this point. We are there is just a very strong generational divide on this. Like yeah. old old guys like us who grew up when you go see cell animation in theaters King. still love it. Still want to see mm -hmm. that stuff. I still like. I like CG animated movies, but so there's I, something yeah. about hand drawn animation that still looks different and interesting, and I want to keep seeing it. Yeah. But the younger kids who came of age post Toy Story, they don't like it. They just don't care. It doesn't look like anything to them. You know. Yeah. Like I, I still go back. To, like I again, I grew up watching Disney movies and all that. But Don Booth, I just really liked his style where he brought a little bit of edge to it and a little bit of more maturity. Like all dogs go to heaven. Like it deals with death. <laughs> like that's the main theme of the movie. Yeah. And you know what you do with your time here on earth and like stuff like that. Like even as a kid, I kind of appreciate it. See again, secret and him is like Shakespearean in the way people are getting cut and killed. Like actual seeing blood for me as a kid was like, what? Yeah. Blood? This dude just got stabbed yeah. and there's blood? This little mouse just shanked somebody. Yeah. Like, to me, that was like, maybe I felt like I was, it was something I shouldn't have been seeing. But, like, for me, like, I watched, I could watch Secret of Nim today and still really get a lot out of it. Yeah, it's, there. I mean, there's something, too, about, I feel like, hand-drawn animation, there's more variability between projects. Like, different animators and different companies, it looks totally different and and computer generated animation like it looks different you could definitely yeah. say like 
this is like the Pixar style versus the DreamWorks style. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look as different. Like there is a sameness to all of these shiny CG characters well, and backdrops that, that is a little bit more standardized. I think when you see when something is rendered so much to the point where it just looks like real life. You're not paying attention to the details much because you just kind of see it and like, oh, yeah, that's a street. When I watch like American Tale and he's like on a boat, like I know every single little detail had to be drawn. Right. Had to be thought of. Like they're not well, they trying I mean, to fool in you. In fairness to computer artists who animate, they, they do still have to think about every detail. True. They can just hit a button and it But it the happens. better they do, the less it stands out because right. it's almost like, oh, that's just an out jungle. Whereas well, yeah, like, I mean, now when it's hand drawn, you're like, oh, man, they – I, I'm not uh, when I'm watching a hand drawn animated. At no point am I supposed to think I'm looking at something that's close to real life. Well, right. I mean, when you're a computer, when you're doing computer animation, often not always. Often the goal is make this look as real, like photo real, like make this look as real Which as it would be, be if we shot a real yeah. monkey or whatever. Uh, and that never is the goal. Like a, a hand drawn animator knows they're never going to fool you. You're yeah. never going to believe that their drawing is a real thing. So that gives them the license yes. to make it personalize and idiosyncratic exactly. and customize it because it's always going to look like a drawing. And I think that we we did lose a little bit of that in the move to computer. Not all, because well, I think Pixar movies look great and it, have their own look. You know, you could use it well. Like, But I think one movie that I thought it didn't really work well was uh, Good Dinosaur. Yes. Because the characters looked very cartoony. The dinosaur looked very cartoony. Right. The human looked very cartoony. Yet the water, the ground, it almost looked like they just shot it like – somewhere in a desert like if your characters are going to look like cartoons put make their world a little bit more cartoony when you put them something that gets a backdrop which looks almost 99 percent like a real backdrop right and then there's a cartoon character with big eyes and little hands i'm like uh you're you're missing something here like you should not put this person in yeah. a photo realistic world. But at the same time, then you can look at something like Coco, and I'm not even sure it would have oh, been humanly beautiful. possible with hand-drawn animation. It's too detailed. It would take artists yes. hundreds of years to put that city, the city of the dead together. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is unlocking things that we couldn't otherwise do. Yeah, Coco's great. And again, when I talked about earlier, Adventures of Tintin, uh, that movie definitely went for more photorealistic, even though the characters still had some features yeah, look, that were right. over cartoony. Uh, but when it came to the action sequences, like it was just amazing what you could do with the camera. That's something you can't do really with 2D. Like 2D, you can only you can't do that scene in Tintin where he goes down and right. his amazing looking one shot in 2D animation. It just wouldn't work. Right. Uh, and I remember when Disney, they started introducing a little bit of CGI. I think Lion King was one of the first ones. Yeah. The Stampede. Well, it, yeah, the, the Stampede looks great. Sometimes they would do it in a way that w really drew attention to itself, which mm -hmm. I now in retrospect don't like. Like Tarzan, they've got that whole oh, scene yeah. swinging through the branches. It's obviously that they did it in CG. And at the time, you're like, whoa, I've never seen this kind of animation in a Disney movie before. But now it makes it look super dated. Yeah. It's, yeah. The, when it sticks out. That's not because it's, it's good. early CG it's, and that yeah. never looks good. Now. When it's seamless, good job. Like I say, early CG never looks good now. But Jurassic Park '93 looks, looks great. Looks amazing. Still it looks great. Looks better than the newer ones. It does. <laughs> Which well, is, sometimes. But so uh, yeah, yeah. Eraser is my favorite example. Remember that Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, God, movie with the alligators? Where he's fighting the alligators or yeah. crocodiles or whatever. They look. If you go back and watch that movie now. Those, they look so, so bad. fake. It's unbelievable oh, wow. that this even got into a movie. Speaking of, uh, you said you had to watch Mission Impossible lately, recently? Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm about three quarters of the way through the first one. I'm watching, I'm going to rewatch all of them. Because let me tell you, the train scene at the end of the first Mission Impossible, that CGI yeah, no, does not stand up. So get prepared no, for that. I know, yeah. Was, that was like, what, 99? 98? No, 90. Not, Mission Impossible 2 was like 98, 99. Oh, so it was like 95? Like 94, 90, oh, 95. Yeah, so that's, yeah, it might have been 96. That's, that's early. You got to cut them a break. I do, but it doesn't look good. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say, a lot of people give Mission Impossible 2 a lot of shit. It didn't have to rely on CGI very much, so all those action guns still stand up pretty much. Yeah, but it's not a good movie. It's not a good movie, but no. I will argue that <laughs> people are right to take issue with it. I think it's actually the only not good movie in that in that series. I will say though, the last thirty minutes, once the action picks up, it's good action. <laughs> you disagree? Yeah, I wish you it's guys a, could see his face. It's it's okay. It's John I mean, Woo. It's okay. With the budget. It, it, yeah, it, it doesn't compare to John Woo sequences mm -hmm. in almost any other great John well, Woo movie. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I guess 
when you think John, I think we I think, mean the one shot with the boat where he spins the motorcycle around pop, is kind of cool. I think when you think of uh, Mission Possible, you think of these grand set pieces, right? Whereas well, John Woo brought to a much more street level yeah. kind of like that's what it's really become. I don't know. In, in the it's interesting to rewatch the first one now because it it is much more of a conventional like spy thriller. It's not really about true, stunts. True. It's not really about action. There's some action in there. It's much more plot heavy. It's plot heavy and it's really much more about yeah the intricacies of this case and you know. Hunt figuring out who betrayed him and that methodological like mystery mm-hmm. thriller vibe that now they've really taken it in a totally different direction. It's much more action and stunt. And now it's stunts is like the whole thing. Since you're, I know you're rewatching them now, but like as of right now, what is your favorite of the? Oh, franchise? Mission Impossible's. That it's actually really tough to say because I think I think three, four, one, three, four, and five all have like individual elements that I think mm-hmm. are praiseworthy. But I would probably go Ghost Protocol as mm-hmm. the number one at this point. I think like. The best action scenes, and it's just, it's really tight. Yeah, I agree with you. I, Rogue Nation was really good. I like Rogue Nation I a really lot. I like JJ, some of the things he brought to it. I think three, it's that Philip Seymour Hoffman performance. He's the yeah. best villain the franchise has ever had. Yeah. And like that that performance is just A+. But I think I agree. I think four, one of the things that he did in four that he didn't do in the others was every gadget failed him somehow. Yeah. And I think that was genius because, like, they all worked in the other movies. Right. Like, what if all your gadgets just, like, almost every time he uses some sort of device or gadget, it it hiccups or something makes... Also, uh, I think that car, the the automated garage sequence is maybe the best pure action sequence in the franchise. I've heard a lot of people tell me, they're like, after that Dubai scene, the movie just can't pick the pace back up. But I'm like, dude, that last car... I love the... The the automated garage is my favorite part of that movie. Wow. Awesome. I mean, I do the Dubai stuff was cool, especially like in IMAX or whatever, but I think it's the car park one that... I've Such a clever idea. I've never thought of an action scene in in a setting like that. Yeah. So let's close the show... Uh, How's Movie Castle? Uh, do you recommend it? Or oh, no? highly. I, I highly. mean, I recommend all all the Miyazaki's all we've Miyazaki? talked about on the show. I recommend if you have not seen them. I think they're easily among the best animated movies of the last few decades. All right. Well, we're going to end the show with a few tweets. I tweeted out that we were recording, and I asked people oh. to tweet the last movie they watched. Yep, of course. And now we'll just kind of do a lightning round. Sure. I'll read a Twitter handle, what they watched, and we will talk uh parker holler at parker holler mm-hmm. kill bill volume two for me it's better than the first Ooh, mm, an you... interesting contention not a lot of people <laughs> i i love both kill bills the first I celebrate... one's the action the second one's the story i Lama celebrate ones, right? the attack i like yes the, the the first one's got the crazy 88s bit which has the really memorable sort of big mm-hmm. huge fight scene i do really like Everything with the bride's final showdown with Bill with at the Bill. end is really good yeah, in that yes. one. And Michael Parks in that scene in Mexico uh, where yep. he's like the brothel owner. Yep. He's amazing in that scene. I, 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 I mean, I really like both Kill Bills. I like them both. I do feel like I do like part two. They give you a lot more of the backstory you of got her. Madsen, a lot more Madsen in part yep. two. And that whole Superman uh, analogy that Bill right, talks yeah. again. And then the fight in the trailer with Daryl Hannah she pulls right uh, out. It's hard for me to say if I like one or two better. Honestly, I haven't revisited them in a while. I They're just both I just always remember first one's all the action, second one's all the story. For the most part. For the most part. There's some story in the There is. There's some there action is. too. But yes, like the, the, the thing to remember though it's that it's that crazy, crazy eighty eight. Crazy eighty eight, yep. Limbs everywhere. That's that's the big Part one. Uh, Devin Coulson, friend of Screen Junkies, of at Devin Coulson. Mad Max Fury Road was the last it. movie he watched. Of course. I think maybe the last master action masterpiece we've had. Has there been an action masterpiece since Mad Max? I don't think so. Uh, it's, I mean, on that level, and, and I mean, people always, it, it is a pure action movie. But it's it's so smart. There's a lot going on in that movie too. It's not just action. He really mm-hmm. the Mad Max world is so interesting, and every new movie he reinvents it, which is that's what I love about that franchise the most. Is that <laughs> there's no laurel resting. Yep. There's no like, well, you know the Mad Max world, so now we can explore this other area or whatever. Every time you go to that universe, it's changed from the last time you saw it. I, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. <laughs> uh, Travis. Wildowski, mm-hmm. also known as at Travis Marvel. I know, yeah, I know. Now he's Travis the Fifth Turtle. Uh-huh. Uh huh. American Tale. We were just talking. Wow. About. What I know. a what an what alignment. What um, a great. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I still have not seen American Tale maybe over a decade, but uh, I still feel yeah, like I been, remember it. It's been a while since I saw it. I saw it a lot as a kid. As a young Jewish kid, that was a big deal. No, it was because well, it does deal with World War II. And well, a lot think of, about it again. What very other, mature things going on in that movie? Think about it. Name another Jewish cartoon character. I can name one. I I know one more. But Cartoon? Can you? Yeah. 
Um, because as a young Jew oh, growing up, tough. I never felt like Judaism was Kyle's like, cousin in South Park. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Kyle, Kyle's yeah, a Jew Kyle. in South Park. Okay, well done. I was I was thinking but, of uh, the Phil. pickles, the pickles from Rugrats. We've established. Oh, that's are, right. Yeah, Jews. They had a Hanukkah special. Um, but yeah, so that was a big thing when I was a kid, and I saw this and like, oh, this this mouse is Jewish, specifically Jewish. Yeah, interesting. I, that's a movie I just want to revisit because, again, it's been so long, and I watched it so much as a kid. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I always it remember that scene with the storm on the boat. Sure. And no cats lost. in America and somewhere out there. And, yeah. yeah, good movie. A <laughs> Don Bluth, man. Uh, he, he's dead, right? Don Bluth? Is Don Bluth dead? Wow. That, uh, that's crazy that I don't, I don't know that. I, 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 don't, I think he is. He's definitely not Because he hasn't done anything. No, he's not making movies anymore. But I, th- I think he passed. I don't know. We should probably look it up. Dude, if that guy's still alive, It's disrespectful why are you... to end yeah. this podcast without saying whether it's true or not. <laughs> it's like, like, how's this guy? Like, I want to know. No, it looks like he was born in 1937. Yeah, I don't recall he's hearing... He's 80 years old. He's still alive. I don't recall hearing that Don Bluth had died. Yeah, he's still alive. Yeah. What is this guy doing? He's one of the best... He's 80. It's hard, oh, it's hard to animate how things. How old's Mizaki? <laughs> well, he's retired, too. <laughs> yeah, he retires and he <laughs> makes a movie. Then he retires... I, I just was such a Don Bluth fan. Like, well, that guy needs to come back, man. Rockadoodle. Uh, rock Rockadoodle fan. <laughs> yes, I love Rockadoodle. Um, uh, Pebble and the Penguin? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gabe Kelly at Gabe Kelly says, only God forgives. <laughs> the follow-up to Drive. Nicholas I'm going to, I'm gonna, your, your, your commenters are not going to like me. Why? I, I like Only God Forgives. I enjoy that movie. I own it on Blu-ray. I also like it. Look at us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is why we're best friends. Yes. Uh, I also celebrate Neon Demon. I love that guy, man. I like Neon Demon. I saw that in theaters. Um, I, I dig Nicholas Winding Refn. He also, he did, I was doing, I did a movie podcast called uh, This Week in Movies that was not well okay. viewed, not downloaded a lot. Okay. Uh, and he still agreed to come on and do, he did our show, Nicholas Winding Refn. No way. That's he awesome. He hung out with us for like 45 minutes. How is he awesome? He's amazing. I love that guy. Anyway, Only God Forgives, I saw it because Drive was one of my favorite films Sure. Ever. How are you not going to see it? Got yeah. Ryan Gosling, yeah. Scott Thomas, yeah. from director Listen. Nicholas Winding Refn. It's like in Thai gambling dens. Who doesn't yeah. want to see that? It's a disturbing film. It's not for everybody, no. but I. it's visually beautiful. So um, good. I really, I even though it's not an entertaining movie in a lot of ways, I still really dug watching it and kind of breaking it down. I'll even, I'll give it a quick plug for Chris Stuckman. He did a breakdown video mm-hmm. of the themes of the movie that I oh, thought was really well. I'm done. I'm gonna check this out. Check that it sounds, out. It's that sounds good to me. Really well done. Uh, yeah, Maybe you appreciate I, the movie a little more. I feel like we have a general prejudice in our film society, whatever, <laughs> okay. against movies that are self-consciously arty and like stylish and that that are just trying to do their own okay. thing in a way that like is is self-aware in a way that is calling attention to itself sometimes that can be fun but i feel like people immediately reject like art for art's sake like i'm an artist and i'm going to make art that's weird and that calls attention to it. people are like oh don't do that it's pretentious or you're not supposed to do that like sometimes those movies are fun yeah, I mean, like, let people be weird and creative. I've, like, you know. I, I've seen every Nic- Nicholas Ruffin film in theaters since Drive. I saw Drive in theaters. Mm-hmm. I saw Only God Forgives in have theaters. You gone, have you gone back? Have you seen, like, Valhalla Rising? I have seen Valhalla yeah. Rising. I, I, I went know. back. The only thing I haven't seen is his Pusher trilogy. Oh, that's how I got into him. Okay. I, I had a roommate many, many years ago named Nathan who loved those Pusher movies mm-hmm. and would watch them, like, all the time. Like, Are on they repeat. good? Oh, yeah, they're a lot. I mean, if you like his style... Yeah. They're like kind of B movies, but they're they're super fun. I, I like them a lot. Um, but that after a while, I was just like, who directed these? And that was when I yeah. started looking at his other also show. went back saw Bronson. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen every one of his films. I saw Bronson. I think in theaters because yeah. I was like, I want to see what oh, else really? this Pusher guy is working on. So I've seen everything but the Pusher trilogy, which is something I yeah. Will Bronson, I was tweeting about a little while because that was also the movie where I first noticed Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Yeah, I think that's really kind of was a breakout for him in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I like that's when like I was like oh that's the guy he was in Inception like when I saw Inception I didn't know who Tom Hardy oh, was oh see by then I was already like <laughs> oh Tom Hardy's in this yeah see I yeah. Can't, I was late to that party um, Lock you've seen Lock right yes Lock it, was really good if you're listening to this podcast right now and you like Tom Hardy please rent Lock it's, it's a one man Tom Hardy show <laughs> it's the Tom Hardy show yeah. nobody else is really in the movie. I think that's one of the most amazing modern movie performances. Also, Warrior was a big introduction for Hardy. Yeah. For me. And a great movie. I like great, Warrior. Love Warrior. Uh, David Wright 
at Dave WRI 96 LA confidential first time viewing. Oh, brilliant movie. Look yeah. forward to watching it again. Love that one. Love LA confidential. One, one of my, one of my favorite movies of the year it came out and I actually, it got me into James Elroy. I started reading James, James Elroy books. Oh, really? That. Great yeah. cast. Uh, Russell Crowe, when he kind of blew up on the sure, scene. Guy Pierce. Now we got Kevin Spacey Kevin in there. Spacey. Yeah, Danny DeVito. Uh, at least Kevin Tom Spacey's well. not the lead. It's a lot. It's a lot of Spacey. I mean, look, there's he's in, he's in a lot of he's in a lot of great movies. It's not a great movies. I like. He's seven. not a great man. I'm glad he's not in movies anymore. But I, L.A. Confidential is great. Yeah, great movie. Um, yeah, just a great cast. And I love. It's so. It's Guy Pierce. Really, that was his coming yeah, out part. That was his big American sort of yeah. debut. But the other great thing about all those Elroy books and stories in L.A. Confidential too is it's not as made up as you would sort of think. Like. It's very rooted in real L.A. history. And if you go back and read, almost all of the sort of non-cop characters are real uh-huh. people. Like Johnny Stompanato is a real guy and Pierce Patchett and all that stuff. Like so much of that is ripped directly from reality that it's, it's amazing. It's like watching this great noir thing, but it's also real L.A. history. Yeah, I, it is. And, you know, I think movies like Chinatown, they don't make enough movies – in that era anymore. I also love Untouchables. Uh, sure, the Palma. Yeah, yeah. Like I, love I'm, I'm, you know, like Hollywood goes through these little phases where it's like, let's do the epic for a little bit. Let's do this, yeah. <laughs> you know, genre. Give me some old school Chinatown Untouchables. Crime, gangster, LA, noir. Like, I love yeah. all that. What stuff, was the last yeah. one to do it? Oh God, it was Gangster, gangster Squad. Gangster Squad. That's what yeah. killed it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, every few years you get somebody's trying to do well. Live by Night that mm. uh, Affleck just did. Yeah, two ones that did not do well. Yeah, you know, I mean. It's hard. I think I think part of it is that it's really hard to do. You know, like, I like Public Enemies. I didn't hate Public Enemies. There's a lot that I really like. I, okay. I don't know if it all I'm not, I'm not holds. I'm saying I love it. I don't but... know if it all holds together. And there is still something, <sighs> as much as I love Michael Mann, there is still something from his digital era, like that one in Miami mm-hmm. Vice. Like, there's something that bugs me about the visual style. They're, they're, they're a little too grainy. Mm-hmm. They're a little too handheld. Like, I want it to look a little bit more polished. Interesting. And it's frustrating when I watch them. But I do think, like... The, the performances are great in Public Enemies, and like the action scenes are really cool, and it's it's different. Like yeah. it feels visceral in a way that Tommy Gunn shootouts usually don't. Yeah, I agree. Uh, another discussion for another day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lon, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, what a pleasure. Uh, this show goes. We're like an octopus, man. We just go in different directions. <laughs> like do, that's why I love about the show because yeah, you brought up. <laughs> Miyazaki, but then we went to animation, CGI, sure. to Mission Possible. We ended up on Public Enemies. <laughs> we ended up on Public Enemies. You never know when a show is going to start and begin. Uh, first of all, guys, thanks so much for listening. Th- thanks so much for subscribing to this channel. Check out my YouTube channel on YouTube, JTE Movie Thinks. I got reviews, spoiler reviews. Lon's on there pretty often. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just go there. Check me out. I just hit over 10K which is great. I'm going to do a Blu-ray collection video as mm. a celebration. Sure. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, requesting like sh- that. show off everything that you've got on yep. Blu-ray. Yeah. Pretty much, you pretty much just go through every movie. And like, <laughs> give about a five second, like, this is why I own this. Wow. That's <laughs> yeah, it's going to take exhaustive. about two hours. Yeah. Uh, guys, Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash JTE April Dawn. It's a Patreon I own my girlfriend. Uh, exclusive podcast. We do a podcast every Sunday called We Have Movie Thanks, where me mm-hmm. and her just kind of talk over the movie stuff. Uh, we give digital movie giveaway. So basically, a couple people every month get a free digital movie. Uh, again, exclusive content. Like when I saw Infinity War and Solo, I recorded a quick reaction just for the, my Patreon supporters, mm, sure. for you guys to listen to. And if you are a Tier 3 supporter, this show ends with one of you giving your mini review of the last movie they watched. Ah, oh, look and, at that. Yeah, this week, James White is about to give you guys a quick little review of the last movie he watched. So let's go ahead, kick this to James. James, what did you watch? The last movie I watched was Regarding Henry. Released in 1991, directed by Mike Nichols, and in one of his earliest credits written by J.J. Abrams. Fun fact, he also makes a cameo as a pizza delivery boy in it. Regarding Henry is about a high-profile and ruthless lawyer, Henry Turner, played by Harrison Ford. After being shot in the head during a convenience store robbery, Henry's left in critical condition. He awakens to find he has no memory, he's lost the ability to walk, read, or even speak. Through extensive physical and mental therapy, Henry's able to regain his speech and his mobility, but his memory still eludes him. His energetic physical therapist, Bradley, played to great effect by Bill Nunn, is able to connect with Henry on a personal and emotional level, and the two form a tight bond working together. Though he's able to physically heal, Henry's greatest challenge is trying to return to a life that he no longer remembers. His wife, Sarah, played by the great Annette Benning in one of her earlier breakout roles, and his daughter, Rachel, are complete strangers to him. 
His colleagues at the law firm both pity him, but mock him behind his back, and he struggles to find bits and pieces of his memory that are buried deep down inside. Henry learns of the man and the father that he used to be, and doesn't like what he sees, and he must rediscover his humanity and the love of his family. The film of itself is charming and enjoyable to watch, but not especially remarkable. In fact, at times, it has the feel of a Lifetime movie, but the performance is really elevated. Harrison Ford puts on easily the best performance I've ever seen him do, especially in his silence. He's able to convey a thousand words with just a glance or a frown or a smirk. It's such a subtle and nuanced role for an actor that most people associate with quippy one-liners, bravado, and charisma. And Annette Bening has a very easy way about her that grounds the family dynamic into reality. I would definitely recommend regarding Henry to everyone, but especially to those who aren't familiar with Harrison Ford's dramatic side and only really know him as Han Solo or Indiana Jones. Thank you.